counterintuitive, but I find sometimes that in a situation like this, if I look around the room at all the faces, it's a little bit easier, kind of calms my nerves a little bit. <laughs> Make eye contact with a few of you. Not everybody, because that would take too long, it would seem kind of weird. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking yesterday, after I received the uh, text from Grace regarding Romans 6, Romans 6, 7, and 8 are the chapters that I've probably read the most throughout my Christian experience. The reason being is it brings me comfort to know that even the Apostle Paul struggled with some things. I'm not suggesting that he was drawn about by his... Uh, sins, but, you know, and we're, we'll address that with this particular chapter, but he did have a few things to struggle with, and he alluded to those. We don't know exactly what they are. In chapter 7, he said that if we agree with the law that it is the good, it is no longer us that commit the sin, but the, the sin that dwells within us. And that brings me comfort. The enemy is referred to in Scripture in many ways, but one of those ways is the accuser of the brethren. Yeah. And he doesn't only accuse us before God, but he accuses us to our face on a daily basis. And one of his favorite accusations is, you're a faker. You're not the real deal. These other people around you, They've got it figured out, but you. <laughs> and he tells us, if you were genuine, you wouldn't have done that. If you were genuine, you wouldn't have had that thought. You wouldn't have that attitude. And he does that in an effort to get us to take our faith away from the completed work of the cross and to put it on our own self-effort. Yeah, right. And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just absolutely have to recognize that that is a lie from the dead man. And uh, hopefully, you know, maybe those words were uh, useful to somebody this morning. Maybe somebody can answer some of, those, some of those doubts. I know I do, and I have to, you know, pray and seek the Lord on that and uh, battle back, you know, every, every single day. All right, little girl. <laughs> <laughs> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. However, can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness, newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dom dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lived to God. So you also might consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey his passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are under law, because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart 
to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. So we're thankful for those freedoms. And we pray for the leadership of our land that their hearts might be after you. We pray today for Barbara Frazier asking you to touch her at home as she tries to recoup her energy and her health. We pray for Anne Mary and we pray for Missy, both facing major physical battles. We lift them to you right now. Thank you for working in them today. Thank you for your faithfulness to Justin as he continues to walk by faith and not by sight. Thank you for healing less totally and completely as you walk him through this time where he is. And your faithfulness, Lord, rings clear for me and Cindy. We're thankful, Lord, that you blessed Joe today. Joyce here worshiping with us, which is a wonderful thing. We pray, Lord, that you'll touch Joe while she's away. Speak to him. Remind him that your love is his and that he belongs to you. Let him hear you speaking to him through your word today. Father, thank you for touching Frankie, battling some things, struggling right now. We lift her to you and ask you to work in her life healing. Thank you that Al and Jerry are up and about worshiping today. Continue to bless every day of their journey. Let it be full of your grace. And Doug, gaining strength, we pray to continue to bring healing and wholeness and health yes. to his body. And Father, we just are, are praying today for little Grayson, praying for this little baby born with an addiction to drugs of some kind. We just pray that you will uh, bring him through this time, healing. We ask you to bless his family. We ask you to work in every member of it, every part of it. Being faithful, showing yourself holy, present, and love. We thank you, Lord, for your redeeming, powerful grace today. And all the sick, all the grieving, all those struggling through things that are bigger than we are, we thank you for hearing us and we cry out for help. And we're thankful, Lord, that you're at work and all these things. We pray for our family members who are not in Christ, who have never been born again, who do not know Jesus. We pray they might come to know you, Lord. Children, grandchildren, siblings, we pray for them, that your name will be exalted, that they will hear your voice, be transformed by the power of the gospel. Thank you for touching our sister Betty today, Lord Jesus. She's a ray of light in how she deals with stuff, and I just thank you for her life. Yes. Thank you for she and Penny as they walk together. I praise you for blessing them, keeping them, putting them right in the front row week after week. Thank you for touching her today, strengthening, blessing her. We'll praise you for your faithfulness. Have your way with us. And the rest and the remainder of this service, your name be exalted, our hearts open, your word true. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Why don't we stand and greet one another and uh, you can pass your peace to someone else. The peace of Jesus, or your Lord. So uh, meet people you haven't met right around you. And then we'll get into the word of God. Drift all the way across the building, but not too bad today. But I didn't tell you not to drift, did I? Time, time consumption gets a little longer, but that's okay with the family of God together. I think that's a, personally, I believe that the time to just greet one another is an important part of being together as a body of Christ in worship and uh, passing the peace you have, the life that you have in Christ off to your
brother or sister, and just greeting them is important. We benefit from that. So we're going to do it, even if it does take a little longer sometime. The text I'm going to read is in the latter part of the 13th chapter of Romans. We're finishing out the 13th chapter today. And uh, I'm going to read beginning at verse number 8. Verses 8 through 14 of Romans chapter 13. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of that text. Since the beginning of chapter 12, actually, we've been looking at a series of statements regarding our relationship. Our relationship to God, where we present our bodies a living sacrifice. We're able to do that, called to do that, because of all of the mercies that we receive from him, this great salvation. <laughs> and then we uh, have a relationship with ourselves, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly, seriously, and to recognize that we're just little parts of the body of Christ, and we fit together with other parts, and we're all gifted by the Holy Spirit with certain gifts that are designed for the benefit of the whole, not just for us. So... Uh, our responsibility is to recognize our position and then be willing to use what God has given us to minister to the whole of the body of Christ. Our relationship to ourselves. And then at verse 9 of chapter 12, we get this whole beginning that leads us even to where we are today in the text. And that has to do with love that is not hypocritical. Let love be genuine. Let it be without hypocrisy hating what is evil, holding to what is good. So what we learned in the last part of chapter 12 were two things. We love the insider. That is, we love fellow believers. We love, quote, one another. And we love those we meet outside of the body of Christ, which we could say like this, we love the other. We love one another, and we love the other or the outsider. In other words, every human being uh, we meet, we have a responsibility, accountability to God for loving them. We got that in chapter 12. And then once we got that, then we were told to um, be subject to the ruling authorities, governing authorities. And so we talked about that last week and how we submit to those who rule over us until those who rule over us demand that we disobey God. For like those first apostles, like Brother Peter said, we must obey God rather than man. We have to make sure though when we're living that we're not just taking offense against one of our pet peeves that is being chopped at by ruling authorities. 
So we have to continually recognize what the scripture says and what is our responsibility to live as a citizen both of heaven, that's our primary citizenship in Christ, and of the United States of America, this being where we live and where we get to live out this gospel that has transformed our lives. And you will notice again at the end of last week's text, verse 7, Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, pay them. Revenue to whom revenue is owed, pay it. Respect to whom respect is owed. Give respect to those that you're expected to respect. And honor to whom honor is owed. Now Paul didn't give us any real explanations about how to figure out who those people are. <laughs> but in the context of any ruling authority or any place where we live, we ought to be able to figure that out yes. as we walk in love. And Paul was talking to a people who were living under a dictatorial leadership with no democracy, no democratic process, rule finally coming to the one who could chop off your head so it was a serious matter to consider how you were going to live in that kind of place or culture. <laughs> and then we're told, right after we're told to pay everything we owe, no matter what it is, from money to respect, taxes to honor. Then he says in verse 8, where we started today, owe no one anything except to love each other. And there are those who jump in on this like crazy and try to show that you cannot have anything whereby you pay something off over a period of time. No credit at all. Listen, Americans love credit. <laughs> in fact, we love debt. You can't have a good credit rating unless you have enough debt. You ever notice? Hey, why is my credit rating down here? And that guy says, oh, well, he's paying different kind of stuff than you are. He bought different things, has different kind of credit. And he has a lot more of it. So that if you're just about in the hole, you can, you can do something with your credit. It's funny. We love debt. We love credit here in the United States of America. We don't wait on anything anymore if we want it. Anybody grow up when I did when your parents were saving money yeah. to buy something? Yeah. Saving money to pay for it when they got it, it's unusual. Now, if, you, if you're blessed and you're able to figure things out down the line, you find you figured out how to put enough money together to buy most things. And some of you are able to do it if you want to pay cash for a house you could. Now, there are, there are reasons why people carry credit for a little while. Um, we, we use a credit card on just about everything every month and pay it when the bills do. You buy everything and when the bills do, you pay it. That works. And it's not a bad deal because you're not in debt. You paid it when it was due. I like the feel of that. Because I'm going to tell you, we preachers did not normally Make gobs of money. <laughs> Not in the churches I'm pastor. <laughs> Independent churches are just that. Independent. <laughs> and they like their preacher to be independent too. <laughs> and not too dependent. And this, is, this church has blessed me from the get-go, from the beginning. And we are so benefited by coming to it in, in this period of our time in life. When you want to have a little say, and then I get guilty. Because I think people are not eating, people are needy, all kinds of needs, and I'm, I refuse to hoard it, but I want to be smart. I'm just giving you a few things that we think about. <laughs> we think about. But if I spend all of my money on me, am I missing something? Do I trust God or my 
I don't know if you can say it enough for some things. Have, have you noticed that? People end up losing a lot of stuff for whatever reason. So that's not what we're talking about. All I want to say to you in this is that we're not talking about having a payment. We're talking about, if we want to talk about it, we talk about being smart so that you pay your payment every time it's due and then you're not in debt. To the point that you are past due. And you owe somebody. You don't owe the next payment until it's due. So you're not owing them until you don't pay it. Yeah. Let's try it this way. I'm getting buried here. By <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we don't have, at least I, I can talk about us as a church, we do not have a machine where you can give with a credit card. <laughs> a lot of churches do. Works. <laughs> we have a relationship, first of all, and we'll come to this, to the law, to what God's law requires. And that's what we get in verses 8, 9, and 10. How do we relate to this law of God, the way we are to live ethically, human in the world, before a holy God? We're to love one. And what does that do? What is what is that about? Um, let me just say it this way. We probably ought to define love first of all. What what is biblical love like? Agape is the is the word we normally use in the Greek, the word that refers to the, the love that God is, and the love that God gives us is out of that root as well. A love that is selfless, not selfish. A love that has a hand out to give. A love that is always letting go for the benefit of someone else. Now, if you want to talk about love in America, you have to kind of think it through because we're not talking Hollywood now. Are we? No. In Hollywood love, you, you have this... Uh, Feeling. It's about how you feel. Now, if I'm going to love you and it's about how you how I feel about you, that could be problematic. <laughs> Couldn't it? I mean, how many of you have learned as Christians to love other Christians that you do not necessarily like? Yeah. Is it okay to talk about it like that? I mean, yeah. you don't want to go out and eat well. Now, if you're a pastor, get ready. Because God's going to work on us, and we're not going to get the feeling. We're not going to get to go by feelings at all. We're going to have to just do it because we love. Love, biblically, is not about feelings. I think I can say it that way. It is not about feelings at all. I don't have to feel like I love the persons or the person I love. I love the Lord my God. People get this messed up, too, because what they do... Coming from my background, what they do is get in a service. Oh man, I felt over today, and I like it. I, I do like it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest. I like to feel His presence. I like to know the Holy God came through. But He's here when we gather in His name. If we don't feel one single solitary thing that we can identify as Him. Yeah. Yep. But we get going and, and, you know, a lot of the choruses that I hear sung in the last few years have been just kind of singing love songs to Jesus, which I think is okay for a moment, but I get tired of the rep repetition and the same old thing all the time. You don't have to feel that to know He's here. Yeah. Right. My best times with feeling is in my own study when I just worshipped Him myself. He came in, I was reading his word, he got me flipped upside down, and I was just praising the Lord. And I've never danced, but I danced before the Lord more than once like that. I wrote a paper at Regent when I was going to seminary in Canada, and I wrote about dancing before the Lord in my study. That was that was a hard thing to write. I mean, this is this is taxing. Yeah. 
<laughs> this is the guy that never wore shorts growing up because my dad said, Sissies wore shorts. <laughs> I was not a sissy. <laughs> Didn't play golf because it was cow pasture pool to him. <laughs> so I had to overcome a lot of stuff, as you can tell. But I wrote about dancing before the Lord and His blessing. And it actually is, is the very same day that the first part of that song we sang has our name on it, Grace and Me. The first day I wrote that was in my dancing experience. It's when it came, just flowed out a few seconds. Haven't had a lot of those. But Virginia Stem Owens happened to be the teacher at the class at Regent. Virginia lives 25 miles up the road or not. And I wrote this and she wrote back. Anyone who can dance before the Lord in your study and be blessed like that by Him, you're not going to run into anything too hard for Him to handle. You're going to handle it. It's true. By His grace, if you keep that. <coughs> Virginia's blind today. My age, blind, has been blind for at least 10 years, legally. And still is able to get some writing done. Yeah. Still is able to serve the Lord in what she does. But she's been through the hard place too. There was a time when she was with her husband at a hippie compound in New Mexico. That's a change, isn't it? She was one of the hippies, one of the real hippies. When they left with their college degrees and went to start a community. You never know that, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen Jungle Doc. We got him past the hippies. He's, he's my Jungle Doc friend. But you know, it's, I love the feelings, but love, let's get this first of all right. Biblical love is not how you feel. It's what you do. I'm sorry you're hungry, and I'm sorry you're cold. Be warmed and filled. And I'm going to pray for you. Yeah. Am I loving them by praying for them? Yes. No. Loving them would be to feed them and clothe them. Yeah. Loving them would be to do something that meets their need where their need is big like that. You see it. Love acts. It doesn't just feel And that's, that's biblical love. We know God loved us not because He has warm fuzzies about us every once in a while and says, I need to bless them. That's not how God is. We know God loves us because He sent His only begotten Son into the world to take my death penalty. And God loved me enough to raise him back out from among the dead in order that he could sign my seal of life in him. Justified. 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 Love dies on the cross. Love is brought back from the dead by a God who loves us. That's how it works. And I got to trying to figure out how in the world can I understand love when it doesn't talk about love? Well, there is one thing I ought to tell you. The quote in this series of verses, 8, 9, and 10. Love your neighbor as yourself. Somebody tell me what book of the Bible that's come from, that's quoted from. Tell me which one. And I'll give you a hint. Old Testament. Shout it out. Which one? There is love in Deuteronomy. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The quote is from Leviticus. Leviticus. 1918. 19 chapter 18 verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let me give you a little run of that. I, I like this and I had done it. Leviticus, that's pretty far back. Here we go. Let me read a little preceding that. We got time, don't we? Yeah. 
Okay. Somebody said, yeah, well, that's enough. <laughs> Here's some things he wrote to his people. Here's some things that God spoke. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Said it to Moses always. <clears throat> Are the ones who led them into the promised land. Joshua and others. When you reap the benefit of your land, the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of the land. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. Shall not deal falsely. Shall not lie to one another. Shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of our God, your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. Wages of hired workers shall not remain with you all night in the morning. You shall not curse the deaf, put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or deferred to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. You shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am. And the Lord. You can take all those instructions together and realize he's saying to love your neighbor, to love as I want you to love, do these things and don't do these. And the text, verses 8, 9, and 10, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. One is left out unless you're in a New King James or an NIV, and that's the one about bearing false witness. And then thou shalt not covet. The commandments, the second section of the Ten Commandments, which has to do with our relationship with one another. What we do if we love one another is that we don't do these things that injure our neighbor. But we go beyond that. Don't you think that living in love with God, living out in your life the love of God, that you go beyond just the negatives? Yes. When you read Leviticus a minute ago, I heard Leviticus, you left stuff in the field, you didn't slander your neighbor. What we do though, if we look at biblical love in a clear and total way is this. We not only don't do those things that we're instructed not to do so that we're not injuring our neighbor in doing them, but we go beyond what the law says and the Ten Commandments are built and shaped in a negative law structure because we didn't have to have a jillion laws to tell us what we could do. We just had to have a few laws to tell us what you couldn't do. How many laws do we have now in the United States of America? Why do we keep making them? Because everybody has to get a law to okay what they're doing. Because we're so out of sorts with the basic laws upon which we were founded. But what we do is we go beyond the law and we serve in a way that seeks the good of our neighbor. We seek benefit for it. We want him not only not to be injured by my action, we want him finally and ultimately to be blessed by God. We want him to know Jesus. Let's talk about it from a Christian standpoint. We want him to be blessed in his family. We want him to be blessed in his job. We want him to learn how to live as we've been instructed to. 
To love him is to long for his good, is to desire his benefit or hers, whatever be the case. Makes sense? Yeah. It's love that acts. Love that does something. And in that something is what we've been instructed to do from the Word of God. So, love means that I cease actions that harm somebody else and do what promotes that person's good. And if we want to talk about our responsibility as Christians to a world without Jesus, we owe a debt that we could not ever pay. And now, living in this world as born again, we owe the debt of love to the men and women we meet who do not know Jesus Christ while we do. That's why sharing the gospel in whatever way we can or ways we can is a vital reality for our living, for our lives. It's not about sentiment or feeling. It's about choice and action. You've heard it said love is a choice. Well, I'm going to go further. I'm going to say love is not only a choice. Love is a choice that leads to action. Love does what love can do. There's a story account in Ezekiel 33 where Ezekiel is commissioned to be a watchman for Israel. And he's instructed that when the, the hordes come, the armies come against Israel, you're to announce that they're coming. If you don't announce it, you are accountable for the bloodshed and the death. If you do announce it and people don't believe it, then they are responsible for their own bloodshed and death. But your task is to warn them. Be a watchman. Now when the armies come against God's people, and the watchman stands and declares the message. The enemy is coming. Prepare. The enemy is coming. Has he loved them? <laughs> Biblically, understanding how God loves, that prophet just loved them by giving them the warning that God instructed him to give that will spare them death. Love obeys. Love cares about the welfare of the other. Love works that way. And the prophet might have stood up. You remember Jonah, he didn't want to preach to Nineveh. He'd have been a lot better off if he just trucked on over there, got him a room in town and started preaching. You know what I mean? But he didn't because Jonah didn't want to preach to them. I mean, he knew, somehow he knew. This people is already an opponent to my people. And one of these days, if we leave them alone, they're going to be strong and powerful and run us all. Concerned about future things. So he didn't rush over and do what he was supposed to do. It cost him a while. Finally, he had to do what? Love them. Finally, he had to go tell them. So that God could save them, which he knew he would. And that bugged him. If I preach to them, they're going to get converted. God is that way. I know this God. But he had to do it anyway. Another thing that's important for you and me is when you, when you have a brother or sister that, that sins against you. You don't go sit down at home and say, well, I love them more they're nasty. Nasty. <laughs> Do like I've done a time too. God, would you get them, please? Just get them. <laughs> so they can know you better. <laughs> and the scripture, 18th chapter of Matthew, for us is pretty clear. If you have a brother who sins against you, don't sit around and wait for him to come. You go to him and tell him the fault between himself and you. Let him know what he's done. Sometimes people don't even know. They've offended. I have found that most of the time people do, but they don't want to admit it. But anyway, that's another story altogether. But you go, oh, by the way, if you know the scriptures and you're 
God's child. He also tells you if you sin against someone, you yeah. go. You're just, that's a catch-22, isn't it? Doesn't matter what you do, you're sinned against or you sin, you still got to initiate things. Yes. That's what love does. Because initiating this thing with someone who sins against you will lead it to the next step if they reject you. You get to take a witness or two with you. And finally, because you're in the context of a community called the church, if you take it that far, then you're going to take it before the leaders, maybe the church, or maybe the whole church finally, in order to resolve the conflict. Yeah. I talked to a pastor the other day, a real, a real, I like him a lot. He blesses my life. And he said, our denomination doesn't know how to handle conflict at all. Well, he's in a denomination that doesn't have a bishop and it doesn't have controlling boards over them. Autonomous churches. But connected. And uh, identified with each other by name, certainly. A lot of other things. Commissions and those things. But to resolve conflict, he said you got a hard-headed pastor who's going to rule no matter what and everybody's afraid to say anything to him and there's no recourse. Nobody to go to. Yeah. Or you got Many in the church who just want to run things. They've chased off pastor after pastor, and there's no way to change it. Yeah. And that happens, doesn't it? What if we just started it when we're individually dealing with stuff? Wouldn't that make it a lot better? Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to love the church. By what? Starting with that fellow who sinned against me who's in the church with me, because that's going to fester, and it's going to spread, and it's going to create sides, and pretty soon. You've got Republicans and Democrats <laughs> are the same type deal. And you have no recourse but to fuss about it. So we started by going to the person who sent us and telling them what it was all about, what you've done. And he can reject it or, or receive it. If he receives it, you gain the brother. If he rejects it, you have a next step. But it's loving somebody to do that. It's loving your brother to do that. Anybody ever had to do that? Oh, yeah. Did you ever fight it hard? Oh, yes. yeah. yeah, it's hard. Take my glove with a rock in it. I mean, you've got to do something. Be ready. It's just something that God blesses. And... Uh, I told you my experience with with a family one time. We were we were raising money to build a building and uh, to build a location we were in a rented building. Years and years. I was young and smart. You know what that means, though. Young and smart. Young and I thought I was smart. Anyway. And so we were, we were crawling along and I had another kind of a agitation going to the church and got this guy stirred, is what it was, really. Another ex-pastor who worked with us, who agitated the situation. And so this fellow got his three or four guys together and they'd given huge amounts, $4,000 all together, I forget how many people it was. But it was, it was money to us, you know. I mean, we we're going to use it, but we weren't going to use it yet. And uh, it was just being done. And so he said, I want that money back. Uh -oh. I should have given the money back. It would have been so much easier. <laughs> so much smarter. Yeah. But I said, no way. <laughs> I hired an attorney. Now we're talking about four thousand dollars in my attorney attorney fees, and this is a long time ago, it was fifteen hundred dollars up front. <clears throat> Which we had to pay. And so when it was all over, they decided we decided things before going before a judge. I mean we had it all figured out. We had this agreement together. We're gonna send the four thousand dollars to missions. We're gonna pay the attorney fifteen hundred. We're not going to have anything left for what we were raising money for. It's all going to be gone. But 
doggone it, he didn't really win. <laughs> we held on. No, we lost it all. Well, the missionary liked it. They got money. But it was just, it was a lesson. I never, ever even had any inclination toward any kind of litigation at all regarding churches and me. I learned. And that's important. We have to learn. But if we could learn to love by acting, not looking for a feeling. I don't think I love them yet. I just forget about that kind of thing. I have to feel right about it. No, you don't. You just obey scripture. You do what God has told us to do and you're walking in a love position. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed. 1 John 3.18. Well, I got to the best part of this sermon. I got 15 minutes finished. So I'll just give it to you in a, in a hurry. The last part of this text. Uh, and by the way, when we love like that, we fulfill the law. It's not, it's not that we just say, okay, that's what the law says and we do it. The law is obeyed when we walk in that kind of love. Our brother and sister is not injured but restored. We have not injured others by our action. We have backed off of that and gone beyond that to desire their good. We win, they win. It's the body of Christ loving. Now, our relationship to the future day is what this second part is about. Besides this, you know, our, and do this Understanding the present time. That's the NIV. The King James, New King James says, and do this knowing the time. Do what? Love like this. Fulfill the law in the light of the soon coming king. In the light of the day dawning. Because that's what we're getting into in this last section about the dawning of a new day. Night is leaving. And day is coming. Let me read it to you one more time so you'll see it. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Do we who are in Christ ever sleep in a way that we need this warning challenge? I mean, do we start living forgetting the end of the day dawning? Yeah, we do. So we have to be waked up. Now, there's another place where it talks about awake from the dead, thou sleeper. And that's talking to people who are just not even born again. They're just in the dark. But these, this letter is written to Christians, and I think there's a wake-up call for the Romans, the church of Rome, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, and the day is at hand. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Now listen to what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, night's over. He said the night is far gone, implying that the night is not yet totally gone. And there is a day dawning so that you're living in the darkness with a view to a little bit of light coming up in the east. Day. So it's time to wake up, soldiers. It's time to take off stuff that's appropriate for the darkness because you're not, you're not men and women of darkness. And it's time to put on the armor of light. Which is what he says first. Armor. Armor. We've almost gotten rid of all of our kind of militaristic terms when it comes to talking about Christians and believers because it's warish type stuff. But when you put on the armor of light, that's a pretty good deal. Light, the armor you put on is designed for the day. And yet you're going to put it on in the dark. While the day is just ahead. And listen, I thought about this a lot this week. And I think this is where we always live as believers. It always comes to this. Where we are living in a world that's yet filled with darkness. We're living among and in all that darkness 
And there comes a time when God comes along and reminds us, listen, what are you doing sleeping? You're not children of the night. You're children of the day. And I don't care if it's dark and you can see that little sliver of light coming. That's all you need to see. Put on the armor and live as if you're in the day. Use the weapon that brings the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit and makes it alive to those yet buried in the dark. Think with me about that. He goes on to say in this, let us walk properly. So he put the armor of light on, walk properly. And as in the daytime, walk properly as in the daytime. The dawning is ahead. Darkness is still here. The morning is coming. Closer all the time. Now, put on the armor of light. It's daytime clothes. Put on the armor of light. Well, let me just jump down the last verse and tell you what it says again. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And make no provision for the flesh. What should Christians be doing in the darkest of the morning? Living in the armor of God. Walking this faith out every single day. Declaring the word of God. That sword of the spirit doing its work in lives. Now is the time to live in the day. As the day approaches. We have a life to live and a job to do right here where we are. It's time for us to wake up. Our salvation is nearer than it was. The night is nearly given up. The day is just ahead. Somebody said, well, Paul said that a long time ago. He wasted no time. He gave himself fully to what God wanted. He lived toward that day. And he knew that if he didn't see him come, he wasn't going to live forever. And the dawning of the day for him, for you, for me, is coming. And some much nearer than we ever thought we'd even last this long. Here we are. We only have so much life. And when it's finished, the day dawns. Amen. We're not going into the dark. We're going through the dark into the day. Amen. Oh, by the way. Whose angel... Is the angel of death? God. Absolutely does not feel. Actually, we always kind of think he belongs to the enemy. No, death has been defeated. Amen. And I got to thinking this week, you know, when I think when the angel of death comes and says, come on, it's time to go, he says, here's the full record of your complete salvation. Your father sent it with me. Wow. Wow. Let's go. It's all been accomplished. It's all been done. So behind the darkness, you know, I see the angel of death. Got this dark, everything, reaping your life. Well, underneath that old black hood and coat and everything is a bright and shining copy of what's restored for you in heaven. What is yours in Christ Jesus? For <laughs> death, sharing it, teaching it, giving it to a neighbor. Still here? Man, oh man. In a brief life, there is so much happening. So much. Here's what he said we're not to do in this darkness yet, which is preceding day, where we're going to put on this armor of light, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to live using that sword, the word of the Spirit. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Properly dressed, properly alive, properly living, armed. Not in orgies and drunkenness, or drunken orgies. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Not in quarreling and jealousy. There is the culture. Yeah. Living for the weekend. Drinking, carousing, all every kind of sexual sin is involved in these languages, this these words right in here. All kinds. The party state of a culture.
But he said, listen, put on the armor of light and put off these things. Don't allow your flesh to rule. Don't make provision for the flesh. Put on the armor. Nowhere for the enemy to win. And walk by the word of God. Walk as light at the end of the day. At the end of the night. Into the day. How bright do you think it's going to be on the other side? <laughs> How well are we going to see on the other side? Man, you're going to, you're going to realize in his presence the armor of light is pretty bright. Clothed in righteousness? Whose righteousness? Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord who rules. Jesus who loves. Christ who anoints us. All three names. Not one marvelous thing. We're too easily satisfied. I think C.S. Lewis was right when he said, you know what, we're kind of crazy, but we're half hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what, a, what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Brother Lewis said. Far too easily. I have respect for the power of the gospel, don't you? Amen. Don't you believe that God, through the gospel, can transform any hard heart? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Shouldn't we believe that when we read scripture or preach scripture or live scripture with people around us? Shouldn't we believe that when we declare His truth or live His truth, backing it up, that we can leave it in God's hands to change a heart and keep believing Him until He does? Yes, we can. All are here are familiar with St. Augustine, aren't you? Some of the Bible teachers like Augustine leave the E off and it's Augustine, put the E on, it's Augustine. That's how you would pronounce it, but maybe it's Augustine, that's fine. Do you know that Augustine was a playboy? Party. That for years and years he just pursued sex and drink and whatever went with it. It was his life. Monica. Mama Monica. Spent all those years praying for him. Trying to set him up with God. Working hard at it. He studied. He was brilliant. Marvelously brilliant. As we later learned, of course, with his theological understanding. And he became, and this is the part that you just have to kind of marvel at. He is a theologian of the Roman Catholic Church and a theologian of Protestantism as well. We all quote it. We all study it. We all read what Augustine wrote after God got a hold of his heart. Changed his life. He was in uh, Milo. And he was out in the yard berating himself because he did this all the time. He reached a point where he was just, he hated himself because he could not practice what was right. And he kept doing what was wrong. <clears throat> and a mistress produced a child who all those years were just wrapped with stuff. And he's prancing up and down. He brought up. Something of the apostles along and just happened to be a copy of Romans. He laid down the table by a friend of his. He'd gone hiking around the garden. He was in Milan trying to figure out what needed to happen to get his mind free and his body free. He was just in turmoil. And he heard the voices of children in the garden next door. Didn't know if it was a little boy or a little girl. Heard voices and he heard them saying, Pick up and read. Pick up and read. He said, got his attention somehow. You know God can get our attention with all kinds of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got his attention. And he's wondering if that could be some kind of game the kids are playing. He couldn't remember any game like that. He just didn't know what it was. So he said, now this is a brilliant line and how simple it gets. It just seemed like God wanted him to go back to what he was reading 
and he closed the book when he left, and just pick it up and open it, and read the first thing that comes up. And we would say, that, that's just infantile. You know how many times we tell people that? Don't, don't do that. He's in a place of conviction. Been going on for quite a long time. He opened the Romans and started reading. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or gratify its desire. Augustine said that at that moment he opened his life to Christ. He, did not, he didn't know how, how he did it. He just did it. He opened his heart to Christ. He'd known about him. Never surrendered to him till that moment. And when he did, he said he felt a healing touch from Christ cleaning his life. And as we all know by his story, he was never the same again. Transformed by the power of God. I never used those verses straight ahead with somebody one-on-one -on -one like that. God did. You don't usually start with quit drinking and corral. Well, maybe we used to a little more than we do now. Maybe we need to come back to it a little bit. I don't know. But God is able to save and deliver the hardest. And our use he wants to use us is simply be available, put on the armor of God. You'll wait. Realize this is the day, this is the moment, this is the time we have. And the dawning, the morning, the day is just ahead. Mm -hmm. And everything we ever hoped for, longed for, desired, expected, thought about, meditated on is ahead. Relationship to the law is love. We love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love our neighbor as ourselves. We walk it out today in the armor of life. Open your life to Him. Give yourself to Jesus. Yield it up. Quit trying to fix it. Quit trying to save it. Lose it in the arms of the Master. He will transform the heart and set you on the road for His glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence today, for loving us, Showing us a little bit more about what it means to love. To love as an act of obedience to your word. Trust in your Holy Spirit. Allow us in the doing of it. Thank you for that. We thank you, Father, today for working in our lives. Praying that if there's one person here today who needs you, may you call them to yourself and may they respond as you call them. May they look at their lives in the light of the day ahead and ask the question, am I ready to see Jesus? Am I ready for what he has? <clears throat> Bless your people, Lord. Work in every life, every individual heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's stand and sing our final hymn, Jesus, Lover, and Master. Thank you.